That was Lament of Orpheus from the game Hades. Now, if you've played anything by Supergiant Games before, you definitely know the work of composer Darren Korb. He takes on an even bigger role than usual in Hades, not only writing and singing in the soundtrack, but voicing the protagonist Zagreus as well. Even though there are several great songs on the soundtrack, I chose the Lament of Orpheus because of how well it meshes with the themes of the game. In order to understand how, it's important to know the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. According to this myth, Orpheus was a poet and a musician without equal. When his beloved Eurydice died, he was so struck by grief that he journeyed to the underworld to plead with Hades, Lord of the Dead, to bring her back to life. His songs of mourning moved Hades so much that he offered him a deal. He could bring Eurydice back to the living, but he could not check behind him the whole way back to see if she was still there. Of course, this being a Greek myth, Orpheus being a foolish mortal, he failed and Eurydice was lost to the underworld forever. In the game Hades, you meet both Orpheus and Eurydice as you try to escape as Zag. They are separated, with Eurydice upset at Orpheus for failing, and Orpheus having lost the will to sing. When Zag inspires Orpheus to sing again with his determination to escape the underworld, Orpheus sings this song. It is in direct contrast to Eurydice's song, Good Riddance. Now, I'm holding back the urge to talk about Good Riddance, um, but the storytelling in both of these songs comes back to one of the main themes of the game. Now, 
I'm not going to spoil anything, but Supergiant brings a signature charm to Hades by building a game that is all about the power of love, family, and friendship. Rebuilding relationships is an integral part of the story, and the dynamic of Orpheus and Eurydice contributes a lot to it. One of the most emphasized parts of the song is when Orpheus sings, Don't Look Back. A key change and a very long note brings attention to the line in a way that invites us to take a closer look. When we do, we can find a double meaning. Obviously, there's the reference to the myth of Orpheus. Looking back is what landed him in this mess in the first place, after all. But the line also encompasses the character of Orpheus as he appears in the game, trying and failing to not look back at the past, at what he has lost. The double meaning is reinforced by the way the line floats above the rest of the music. Can he stop looking back? Well, we don't know. And the drama of the music reinforces that lack of confidence. One thing that contributes to this sense of drama is that the rhythm of the arpeggios changes from groups of two to groups of three. This upsets the rhythm we are expecting to hear and undermines our confidence that Orpheus will solve, quite frankly, anything. Contrast this to Don't Look Back at the end of the song. We've returned to the original key of G minor as Orpheus frantically repeats the line faster this time. Returning to the original key reflects that nothing has changed. It is a lament, after all, and try as Orpheus might, his fatal flaw is that he can't stop looking back. This seemingly inescapable pattern points to more than just the character of Orpheus. It reflects the very structure of the game itself. As a roguelike, the gameplay and story is all about breaking cycles. Zag tries to escape the underworld, but every run ends with him being right back where he started. Orpheus' story and lament fits perfectly in the setting in what we could call the ludo-narrative of the game, or the way that the gameplay and the narrative, in this case reinforced by the soundtrack, interact. Because the words and vocals are so important to the story, both in meaning and because it's being sung in-universe by the character Orpheus, I put an extra care to mimic the sound of Korb's singing. One of the ways I did this is by varying the lengths of notes, which gives the same musical function as different lyrical sounds and syllables. In my video on Ashes of Dreams, I talked about how I play smooth, connected notes. I went for something a little more in between here. For instance, take a listen to this motif from the opening of the song. It's subtle, but there's a bit of space between notes. approach this is by thinking about the three parts of the note. The start, or the attack, the middle, or the sustain, and the end, or the release. For this particular bow stroke, I use a little bit more bow speed at the start of the note to give it some emphasis without making it sound too sharp. This is similar to how you would play an accent, but a little bit more subtle. The bow speed all comes from the arm, with the fingers remaining loose to avoid the bow skipping or getting any unpleasant sounds. Here's an example with no accent, a subtle accent like I do in the cover, and a strong accent. Pay attention to how fast my arm moves at the start and in the middle of the note once it is slowed down. So I'll start with no accent at all. You see how my arm moves the same speed the whole time? Now I'll do a subtler accent. You'll notice there's a burst of speed at the start, and it slows down a little so that I can play the rest of the note in one bow. Finally, I'll do a strong accent, and I'll probably exaggerate this a little more than you ever really would in music, but it'll really show you how much of a difference a fast bow at the start can make. The harder part of this bow stroke is the release. Because the notes still need to feel connected, you have to be really careful not to end it too soon. The way I think about it is that I play just like I would a connected note, but I release the pressure of my arm at the end to stop the note from sounding. Even though the bow is just barely off the string, 
I imagine that I continue to play the note, pushing the sound out into the air. Here's the difference between a smooth connection, a lift like I do in the cover, and a substantial release. So I'll start with completely connected notes. Now I'll do a release like I do in the cover. It's subtle, so pay close attention. You hear how sometimes it's a little bit more connected and sometimes a little bit less connected? That's okay. It's difficult, and as long as you keep the feeling of music there, it's gonna sound really, really nice. Finally, I'm gonna play it in a very disconnected way with a large gap between the notes. In this case, I release probably way too early, but you know, if you like it, do it that way. Every note you play has these elements to it. Part of practicing is thinking about each element and how you can change them to better suit the music. Now, we have some conventions around what sounds good and what doesn't, but there's nothing stopping you from trying something unconventional, for putting attacks, sustains, and releases together in a way that you wouldn't have thought to do in the past. So I really encourage you to experiment and see what you like, what you don't like what's easy and what's hard. Sometimes you'll make a great discovery of something that you just absolutely love. So I'd love to hear what you're practicing or listening to this week. I'm working on my rhythms and especially my syncopations because they're honestly a little bit sloppy. I'm not happy with that. I do this by both playing with a metronome but also playing a second violin part with an orchestral recording. I think that's a really fun way of forcing yourself to listen to other parts while still having fun and not getting dragged down into the tedium that sometimes playing with a metronome can be, where you're just sitting listening to the metronome for half an hour. As always, thanks for watching, and let me know if there's a song or game you'd like for me to cover and give a mini lesson on. Until next time.